Hey, Bowtie Nation, what's going on? Your Bowtie Warrior here, Joseph Hogue with the Let's Talk Money channel. Loving this series of investing videos, and today we're bringing it all together with the 10 financial ratios every investor must know. Nation, over the last two videos, we've talked about how to read a stock quote, and then the last video went step by step through the stock analysis process that I used as an investment analyst. But these ratios are so important because not only are they going to help you understand if a company is heading in the right direction, these 10 financial measures are going to help you avoid some of those worst stocks that lose your money and pick the best investments in this market. I'll show you each of these investing terms, what it means, and how to use it in your analysis. I'll reveal which are the most important and my single favorite, the one financial ratio that every analyst goes to immediately when they're looking at a new stock. Make sure you stick around for that last one because while it is a little bit more technical, this is the bread and butter for Wall Street analysts. And most investors don't know about it and it will give you the edge in picking your stocks. Before we get started though, I want to send another shout out to all you in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. Now, as we're working through these financial ratios, remember there are two ways to use these. First is by comparing it with the company's own historical trend. So for example, if we're talking about a company's return on equity, how well it produces that shareholder value, and we get something like a 15% ROE, how is that compared to what the company did last year or over the last 10 years? If that return on equity has been trending down over the last couple of years, say from 20% three years ago, you better believe I'm looking for a reason and a plan by management to boost it again. Now, the second way to use these ratios is by comparing them against competitors in the same industry. For example, IBM books a 49% return on equity versus just 30% at Cisco and 44% at Microsoft. You know, how is management at IBM able to get that return? Can they keep it up? And does it tell us that the company has a competitive advantage over its peers? Now, that last part about comparing a company against others in its own industry is really important. Comparing some of these ratios for a stock like, like Microsoft against numbers you see in maybe something like Procter & Gamble isn't going to tell you anything. The business models and the environment in which these two companies compete are just too different. You know, just because management at Procter & Gamble is only able to eke out a 10% return on equity doesn't mean you should avoid it and jump into some of the maybe those three tech names that we looked at. It might be that compared to peers in that consumer staple sector, Procter & Gamble has an amazing ROE and is using that to really reward its investors. This is why one of my favorite tabs in our portfolio spreadsheet I developed is this comparison tab. With the spreadsheet, you can put in two stock symbols here. So we'll use Nike and Coca-Cola, click compare, and the spreadsheet is going to pull all this financial information from the internet. You can compare the price to earnings ratio for a company against the average in the sector as well as against another stock. We've also got the price to sales ratio, uh, some of these profitability measures like the operating margin and profit margin, and other comparisons for debt to equity and dividend yields. I'll leave a link to download the spreadsheet in the description below. Uh, besides that stock comparison tab, it's going to help you track your portfolio, see the gaps in your investment, and even plan for your retirement. Now let's get into those 10 financial ratios, but I also want to hear what you do to analyze stock picks. What are the financial measures and the analysis you use when, when looking over those best stocks to buy? So scroll down and let us know in the comments which ratios do you use? Now our first four ratios are everyone's favorites, the price multiples with price to earnings, price to sales, book value, and my favorite, enterprise value to sales. Price multiples give you an idea of value in a stock. Now what price are investors willing to pay for the company's earnings or sales, and is that too high, low, or just right? And it's easy to see why investors love these so much, because they tell you if you're getting a good deal. You know, finding any of these is really easy, and we'll cover the first three together, then that enterprise value next. These are always on a per share basis, so the price of each share divided by the earnings per share or the sales per share. Earnings are usually given on a per share basis, but to find these other two, you'll probably have to divide them by the number of shares outstanding. Now finding this is easy enough though, uh, you can either look for the number of shares, something like on the statistics tab for, for the company on Yahoo Finance, or just take the market value of the company divided by the price per share, and that's going to give you the shares outstanding. So you've got this price to earnings, or the P-E ratio, but what does that mean? And we can see that shares of Apple trade for 25 times its earnings. You now Apple made $12.75 in net income per share last year, and investors are paying 25 times that, or around $318 each for the share of stock. Again though, you can compare this with the history of the stock itself. 
If we look back, we can see that shares of Apple traded for 15 times earnings less than a year ago and have traded for as low as 10 times earnings over the last decade. Now, just going on that tells us that shares of Apple are pretty expensive right now, unless you think that earnings are gonna grow very quickly over the next year or two. You can also compare that PE ratio against peers like Samsung or Sony. You know, are shares of Apple expensive or cheap compared to their competitors? And while everyone loves to use that PE ratio, I like these others a little bit better. If you remember from that second video in the series where we looked at the income statement, these numbers on this statement are very easy to fudge. You know, management can give more credit to its customers so it increases its sales for that quarter. It can defer paying some of its expenses or convert some of them into those long-term investments so they don't count against profits in this quarter, kind of like what AOL did with all those annoying CDs in the 90s. You know, all these shenanigans can just be played to make earnings or net income look higher than it actually is and higher earnings means a lower price to earnings ratio and, and the stock looks like a great deal when it's not really. Instead, I'll use that PE ratio, but I'll also use something like the price to sales ratio as a double check. And for financial companies like banks and insurance, uh, the price to book ratio is a great measure because their assets and liabilities are usually pretty close to the market value. And with most other companies, you don't get that and the book value isn't as close to that actual market value. This enterprise value to sales is a little different, but the preferred ratio for a lot of analysts, especially venture capital and M&A analysts. While these other value ratios only account for the market price of the stock, so the stock price over sales, the enterprise value is more like the company's total value. So here's what you do to find the enterprise value. Take the market cap of the stock and remember from our first video on how to read a stock, that's the total value of the shares of the stock in the market. Then you go to either the balance sheet, which is gonna show you everything the company owns and owes, and look for two things here, the cash and marketable securities, that's how much liquid cash the company has in the bank, and the company's long-term debt. Now here's where it gets fun. Okay, fun for us investing nerds, but anyway, think of the enterprise value as what a takeover buyer, you know, one of those corporate raiders of the 80s, would have to pay for the company. It's the market value of the shares minus the cash the company has in the bank because someone could buy the company and have all that cash as an immediate discount. So you take the cash available off the market cap, but add in the amount of debt because taking on this company means a buyer would also now be responsible for that debt. So again, market cap minus cash plus long-term debt. This is a much better estimate of a company's value than just taking the stock price. And here you can take this number divided by sales and enterprise to sales ratio for a great look at its valuation. I know this is a little more complicated than just looking at that stock price versus earnings or versus sales, but this enterprise value to sales ratio is so much better, especially for companies that owe billions in debt. You know, all that debt, that financial risk doesn't show up in the stock price, so there's no way to measure it in a simple PE ratio. Our next ratio here is a great one for measuring management's ability to get the best return on your money, the return on equity or ROE. Return on equity is super simple to calculate. You just take the company's net income that's found on the income statement, take that and divide by the shareholder's equity, which is one of the last lines on the balance sheet. So if we look at these two pieces, ROE shows you how much money, that's that net income, management is able to produce each year on the equity owner ownership in the company. It's how much the shareholders, that's you, get as an earnings return on your money. I actually have kind of a love-hate relationship with the ROE. On one hand, there are so few good management return measures, so you really do need it in your toolbox. It's very easy to calculate it, and most investing sites do the calculation for you. Uh, for example, here on Yahoo Finance on that statistics page. But as we talked about earlier, that net income is just a, such a terrible number. There are so many shenanigans that by the time you get to that bottom line number, you know, from deferring expenses to booking questionable sales, using taxes to skew the numbers, you just can't trust net income. So any ratio that uses it, like that return on equity, is gonna be questionable to use as well. That said, I would still put this one in my toolbox for analysis. Uh, with all the other ratios, if you still can't decide between one stock or the next, that ROE can be a tiebreaker for you. Next here, I've gotta to apologize to everyone here in the nation because you're gonna to have to hear me talk about the operating margin once again. All my bow tie warriors out there, you know the operating margin is my favorite financial ratio. And this operating margin is the percentage of sales left over after paying operating costs to run the company. So this is a pure measure of how efficiently management turns those sales into profits because it only includes those operating costs, not the effects of taxes or financial leverage, which all appear further down on the income statement. So the operating margin is the operating income. Now that's usually about halfway down the income statement 
divided by the sales or the total revenue reported at the top of the page. That percentage profitability can tell you a lot about a company. How well does management turn those sales into profits, again, versus its own historic trend and against competitors. A company that can get more profit out of its sales is going to take more market share, grow faster, and ultimately just be a better return for investors. Our next ratio is a big one for dividend investors, the payout ratio. Now, the payout ratio is how much of the company's earnings it has to pay out to cover the dividend. Not only will this show you if a company's dividend is in danger of being cut, it gives you an idea of how fast the company can grow and even if it might increase the dividend. So if we take that dividend amount, and not the dividend yield here, but the actual dollar amount of the dividend paid over four quarters, then you divide that by the net income per share or earnings per share of the company. That's gonna give you a percentage, say 0.25 or 25%, it means the company uses 25% of its earnings to pay that dividend. Now, there are a few ways to use this information in your analysis. And one is the company paying out more or less of its earnings for that dividend compared to its peers. A company paying out almost all of its earnings isn't saving much back for growth. So is that high payout ratio gonna mean that the company can't compete against its peers, against its competitors, and maybe falls behind in growth a little bit? Also, if the payout ratio is trending higher over the last few years, well, that mean dividend increases are reduced or maybe even cut. You know, cutting the dividend is the last resort for most companies, but it does happen when those earnings fall short. You just can't, can't pay out 100% of your earnings for dividends all the time. A warning here though, you cannot use this payout ratio for companies with a high amount of depreciation. This is gonna include real estate stocks, so those REITs, or Energy Master Limited Partnerships, MLPs. The problem here is that these companies report so much depreciation on the income statement, so that tax write-off from owning property or, or those capital assets, that it totally skews net income lower. The payout ratio for REITs and MLPs will tell you nothing because that net income even is a worse measure here than it is for a lot of other stocks. Just one more ratio here before we get to that last one that every investor should be using, and this one is the debt to equity ratio. Now, debt to equity is another easy one and is helpful in seeing the amount of financial risk in a company. It's going to show you how much debt the company owes compared to how much shareholders actually own. This is just the total liabilities of the company. That's going to be almost at the bottom of the balance sheet divided by the total shareholders equity, which is a little bit further down. So how much debt does the company owe? How much of that financial leverage is it using compared to its total shareholder value in the company? Now understand that debt isn't necessarily a bad thing for companies. It helps them get cheap financing and not dilute those uh, current stockholders. You know, for example, if a company used no debt to pay for its projects, it would constantly need to sell more stock, which would mean you have to share those earnings with more investors. So just like those other ratios, compare this debt to equity ratio of a company only with others in its industry or sector. You know, comparing the debt to equity of a utility company, which can easily be in the high 60 or 70% range with a tech company and a ratio of maybe 25% debt to equity doesn't tell you anything. Utility companies have very stable cash flows, which means they can get lots of cheap debt for funding. Tech companies, though, are paying much higher interest rates, so they tend to use less debt in their capital structure. The debt to equity is another one that I made sure to include in our stock comparison spreadsheet, so you can easily compare it against those other companies or the sector itself. Now, I saved this last ratio for the end because it's harder to calculate, definitely more technical, but for anyone with the dedication to stick around to this point, this is one of the best ratios to analyze a stock. Here I'm talking about growth and cash flow from operations compared to net income growth. Remember from our video on financial statements, the statement of cash flows is a real picture of cash in and out of the company. There, there are still ways for management to fudge these numbers, but it is so much harder to manipulate this statement compared to when you're looking at that income statement. So this is a much purer picture of that strength of a company, that statement of cash flows. And that first section in the statement, the cash flow from operations, that's showing you the actual cash generating power of this business. If we look at that line, cash flow from operations, it's showing us how much cash the company is bringing in for that core business. And you can take the, that divided by previous years to get a growth rate in this cash flow. What you can do is find the growth rate of that operational cash flow. And we'll look at an example next. And then you can compare that growth in cash flow to the growth rate in earnings on the income statement. And what this is gonna show you is quality of earnings. If the net income or the earnings reported are high quality, the growth in that number should be pretty close to the growth rate in actual cash collected. Let's look at an example, and I think this will help it make more sense for you. Here we see the statement of cash flows for Apple, and I've only taken the top section of the cash flow from operations. 
The company booked $69.39 billion in 2019 cash flow and $65.82 billion in 2016 cash flow. I like to use a longer term measure of this growth rate rather than just one year to the next. Uh, over any given year, any of these numbers can jump around a lot. But if you look out over a longer term trend, like three or even five years, you get a clearer picture of overall growth. So I'll take that $69.39 billion in 2019 operational cash flow and divide it by $65.82 billion for 2016, which gives me a 1.054. And if we get a three-year annualized number for this, it comes out to growth in cash flows of 1.74% a year. Now, Apple's cash flow has jumped around a lot over the last few years, so I'd want to look into that anyway. And why did the cash flow fall in 2017 and then again in 2019? But if we go to the income statement and look for this net income available to shareholders, we see that Apple reported $55.26 billion last year and $45.69 billion in 2016. Again, we divide the 2019 number by the one reported in 2016 and get that annualized for a 6.5% yearly growth in net income. Now that's a pretty big difference, so I'd also want to look maybe a little further out, maybe the last 5 or 10 years. But the fact that the company reports a faster growth in net income than actual cash flow doesn't automatically mean it's the next Enron. There are a lot of reasons why these can be legitimately off. You know, for example, companies that make sales on credit, uh, giving buyers time to pay, might book their sales in one period but not actually collect the cash until another. So there's almost always going to be a difference in these numbers, uh, the difference in growth in net income by the growth in cash flow, but it does become a problem when the difference gets progressively wider and goes on for years. You know, invoiced customers have to eventually pay, and you'd expect a lot of these differences between cash and income statement to balance out over a couple of years. When that doesn't happen, it can be a warning of two possible culprits. First, if management is playing shenanigans with the income statement. You know, using legal and not so legal tricks to make earnings look better than they actually are. That's going to show through in this net income growth that's faster than cash flow. It can also, though, be a sign of bad investment decisions on the part of management. If the company is investing in a lot of equipment and other assets that are getting depreciated on the income statement but never result in much cash flow, then it might not necessarily mean management is doing anything illegal, but they just definitely aren't helping investors any. I know this is a lot of accounting to throw at you, but this is one of the best ways to compare companies and find those quality earnings that are going to grow a stock price. A company's management can fudge its income only for so long. Eventually, the company with that best quality income, the one where actual cash flow matches up with net income growth, those are going to be the ones that reward shareholders with higher returns. Click on the video to the right for everything I look for in picking a stock. A quick step-by-step -step to reading a stock and its financials. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.